on the morning of May 15, 2001. Ruby Havard reported her two-year-old son, Wesley Dale Morgan, missing. According to her account, Wesley had been playing outside on the front porch while she went inside to prepare some food. When she returned just five minutes later, Wesley was gone. Authorities immediately launched a widespread search, initially believing Wesley might have wandered into the woods. However, as days passed without any sign of the toddler, authorities began to theorize that he had been sold in an illegal adoption, kidnapped, or even murdered. Despite a thorough investigation, no trace of Wesley has ever been discovered. It's been more than 22 years since Wesley went missing, and investigators are still searching for him. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a former police detective and licensed private investigator, and each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve the case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, which is what we do here, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. Okay, I'm not going to take a lot of time here. We're going to get right into this one, Wesley Dale Morgan. This case is over 22 years old, and I'm covering this one because although there may not be a ton that can be done now from, from our perspective, it's important to keep these cases in the circulation of the media, if you will. And I don't think it takes a lot to connect this one. Some of you have commented in the past about how I wear this bracelet every week. For those of you who that don't know, uh, I have two daughters, Tenley and Peyton. They're 11 and 8 years old. They both just had their birth birthdays recently. And uh, Tenley made this for me a while back as a way of her knowing that I'm thinking about her while I'm doing whatever media stuff I'm doing. She, I, I originally, funny story, and I'll make it super quick. She wanted to make me a bracelet. I had an old one from her that broke. And so I said to her, hey, listen, a lot of the stuff that I do is sad, sad stuff. And so make it something that's, you know, you can see it, but it's not going to stand out. This was her, this is where her, her interpretation of that. For those who, who are listening on audio, it's a rainbow colored bracelet. So yeah, she just, completely disregarded that request and said, nope, I want to be able to see it. I like colors. Here you go, daddy. And obviously, you know, she's going to get what she wants because I am a girl dad all the way through. Um, so to bring it back to Wesley, my biggest fear, my biggest nightmare is having something happen to one of my children. Uh, I think that's the biggest fear for most parents. So when I hear these stories, it's impossible not to relate it to your own life and kind of triggers your own fears that unfortunately you have every once in a while that creep up into your brain and you wake up in that cold sweat and you are so blessed that it's not true, that it's not real. Um, but for some people, like the people in this case, this nightmare is their reality. And I can't imagine how it feels to be in this position to go through something this long and to have no answers. And I've said it before on other cases I don't know how I would feel, but as a parent, I I think I would, as horrific as it could be, I would want to know. I would want to know for certain what happened, even if it was the worst possible outcome. The unknown, I think, for many people is the biggest, the biggest nightmare, is the worst case scenario. Because as a parent, you're sitting out there and you have this hope that maybe, just maybe they're still out there somewhere and they're okay. But then there's the other end of the spectrum and they could they could be gone. So I think at this point, having answers is most important for these family members. And I think the only way that we could potentially achieve that is by making sure everyone knows about their cases. And maybe there's some pressure that's put back on the agencies that are involved with these cases 
to maybe take a second look at it and to maybe have some new people come in and look at it. And hopefully they find something in the initial reports that leads them down a, a new path and hopefully has some good results. So with that all out of the way, let's get into this week's case. Wesley Dale Morgan was born on March 14th, 1999 to parents Ruby Havard and Dewey Morgan. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about Wesley as a person, given that he disappeared when he was only two years old. What we do know is that Ruby gave birth to Wesley at the age of 17, while Dewey was 24. Approximately a year later, Ruby and Dewey parted ways. Following their separation, Ruby and Wesley moved in with her new boyfriend, 36-year-old Burnell Hilton Jr., and his 17-year-old son. Their home was situated in the 2700 block of Highway 63, just outside the small town of Clinton, Louisiana. Nestled in a rural area, the house was surrounded by dense woods and was near a long, winding creek. On March 14, 2001, Wesley turned two years old. Tragically, this was the last birthday his family would celebrate with him. Two months later, on May 15th, at 10.05 a.m., Ruby contacted the Clinton Police Department to report Wesley missing. When officers arrived, Ruby recounted the events leading up to the disappearance. She explained that earlier that morning, she and Wesley had been home alone, playing with four puppies on the front porch. At around 9.45 a.m., Ruby stepped inside the house briefly to prepare some food. Upon returning just five minutes later to check on Wesley, she discovered that he was missing, along with two of the puppies. Ruby mentioned that she had searched for 15 minutes before contacting the police and noted that she hadn't heard any vehicles during her time inside the house. She then provided the police with a detailed description of Wesley. He was Caucasian, three feet tall, weighing approximately 40 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was last seen wearing blue shorts with a green stripe on the leg and a gray Mickey Mouse shirt with sandals. Police searched around the house for Wesley, but didn't find anything. Now, they did locate one of the missing puppies across Highway 63, which, as I said earlier, is right near Wesley's home. However, the police believe this distance would have been too far for the toddler to travel on his own. And as far as I can tell, the other missing puppy was never found. Before we continue on, let's take a quick break and hear from this week's sponsor, Babbel. All right, so fast forward to the end of 2024. Think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If you want to learn a new language, you absolutely should get Babbel. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations, and Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible and rooted in real life situations and delivered with conversation based teaching. So you're ready to practice them in the real world as soon as you learn them. Now, I recently had an experience that maybe some of you can relate to. I was traveling back from New York City with uh, an Uber driver and he was saying a lot. I couldn't pick up on all of it, but I was able to pick out a few key words and realize he was asking me for my address and what floor I lived on. And I was able to respond to him in Spanish. And I'll tell you, it was very natural. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to look something up. Just from using Babbel's program, I heard those words and was able to respond immediately, which made for a much smoother experience between me and the Uber driver. And by the way, you don't have to take my word for this. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. One study even found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. And Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold, so clearly... They're doing something right. And if that's not enough, Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are all backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. And right now, I have a special offer for you here, right on Detective Perspective. Get 50% off at babbel.com slash detective. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash detective. Rules and restrictions may apply. I want to thank Babbel for supporting us. Let's get back to the episode. Okay, so we're back from the break. Police were now concerned that Wesley had wandered off into the dense woods that surrounded the house. They sprung into action and initiated one of the most intense searches in Louisiana history. Some of the officers set up roadblocks to interview drivers, 
while others searched homes and questioned neighbors. Clinton police further enlisted the aid of other police departments, firefighters, inmates and guards from two local prisons, and volunteers to conduct ground searches. The Associated Press reported the search teams utilized bloodhounds, horses, four-wheel drive vehicles, and helicopters in their efforts. In addition to searching the woods, firefighters drained a sewage pond near Wesley's home and searched a creek that lined a clearing by the home as well. Additionally, Sheriff Bunch from East Feliciana Parish personally wadded through a pond on the opposite side of the highway. Now, unfortunately, there was no sign of Wesley in any of these locations. As night fell, many volunteers went home, while some deputies stayed behind to continue searching. The police informed the Associated Press, quote, We'll have a crew out on four-wheelers to go into the woods, stop every 50 yards or so, cut off their motors and holler and listen. Now, I've never personally worked a search of this magnitude. Um, we have had missing children in my jurisdiction. Fortunately, for the ones that I was involved in, we, we were always able to find the child. They were usually in close proximity. But I can tell you, even for that, you know, those few minutes where you don't know uh, where this child is, and this was even before I had children, it's, it's all hands on deck and it's a sense of urgency and panic, even in you as law enforcement officers, uh, that I can't describe. Um, now, there were cases before me in my jurisdiction where the child was not found. Michelle Norris, it's a case I've covered multiple times uh, in different capacities, the biggest being breaking homicide. It was actually at our season premiere of Breaking Homicide. And I will eventually cover that case here as well because it would it would fit the profile. And I think you guys uh, should hear it for those of you who, ha who don't know the story yet. But to bring this all back to this case, it's, pretty, it's a pretty big statement to say this was one of the biggest searches in Louisiana history. And that just tells you the magnitude that was on this. You're really up against it in this situation. You have a two-year-old out in the woods you're obviously worried about them hurting themselves or an animal getting a hold of them. There's so many different things that are a danger to a two-year-old because they really can't defend themselves. So you want to find them as quick as possible. That's best case scenario that they just wandered off. Worst case scenario is that someone took them. And if that's the situation, you want to develop a perimeter that's wide enough to compensate for the duration that they've been missing. To kind of make that even more simple, if they've been missing 15 minutes, if someone's in a car, how far could that suspect get with them in that 15 minutes? You want to try to figure out what that that radius would be and almost double it. So that way, if someone is trying to flee that immediate area, if you have all paths of travel blocked off, you're going to intercept that person before they're able to get away permanently. Now, unfortunately, that didn't happen here, but there is obviously a lot more to the story because we're not taking into consideration that we're going off the word of the last person to see them. I'm not saying at this point I don't believe her, but again, you're going off that information, and in that moment, there's no way to verify it. You're going off their word and hoping they're telling the truth, but there is a possibility that you're searching for someone who's not even there. Now, the search for Wesley continued the following day with the search team still combing through the woods. This exhaustive effort would stretch for about a full week with searchers putting in very long hours in the process. With everything already underway, Sheriff Bunch called in the FBI to aid in the search for Wesley. The FBI dedicated over four hours to scouring the home and Burnell's pickup truck for evidence. Authorities also questioned Wesley's parents, Ruby and Dewey, along with Ruby's boyfriend, Burnell, and other family members as well. Later that night, a helicopter operated by the Louisiana National Guard conducted an aerial search of the vicinity around Wesley's home using thermal imaging equipment. Now, despite their best efforts, no trace of Wesley was found. On May 17th, two days had passed since Wesley went missing, and the police announced that the investigation had been escalated to a criminal level. They now suspected Wesley had either been kidnapped or killed. Unfortunately, Louisiana did not have an Amber Alert system in place at the time, so they were unable to notify the public about Wesley's possible abduction. On that same day, the FBI administered polygraph tests to Ruby, Burnell, and Burnell's 17-year-old son. According to Sheriff Bunch, both Ruby and Burnell failed their tests, 
with Burnell's results specifically described as, quote, off the charts. After taking the polygraph, Burnell told the Associated Press, quote, Ruby had been taking this hard. They've been treating us like murderers. They're looking at the wrong people, but like they said, they're doing their job. The next day, May 18th, the ground search continued, with teams focusing on scouring driveways, culverts, and bridges. There was still no sign of Wesley anywhere. Now get this, on that same day, Burnell was arrested and charged with attempted second-degree murder in an unrelated case. Police revealed to the media that during their investigation into Wesley's disappearance, they uncovered details about an altercation involving Ruby and Burnell's ex-partner. The dispute stemmed from Burnell's involvement in a shooting incident with a man named John back in 1998. According to John's account, he was walking along a road around 11 p.m. on Halloween night in 1998 when a man in a white truck abruptly stopped, brandished a pistol, and shot him without warning. Fortunately, John survived the ordeal, but the shooter's identity remained unknown until police were investigating Wesley's disappearance. Around three hours after Burnell was arrested for attempted murder, two FBI agents brought Ruby in for further questioning. She was later released, and a deputy was assigned to monitor her home around the clock, with another deputy tasked to follow Ruby whenever she left the house. This routine continued for weeks. On May 21st, Sheriff Bunch told the Associated Press that investigators were still trying to unravel the stories Ruby and Burnell had provided regarding Wesley's disappearance. Bunch said, quote, As deep in my heart as I can believe, that baby never left that house walking. He was carried out of there. Bunch mentioned that Wesley was possibly involved in an illegal adoption arrangement. Now, illegal adoption arrangements, you know, you can have situations where parents who, let's be honest, don't care about their kids and are in a financial bind may sell their kids to some individuals who wouldn't get approved for an adoption otherwise for a, an agreed upon amount of money. Obviously, this is unethical and illegal. <laughs> So it shouldn't happen, but uh, it does from time to time. And there's been other cases where a legal adoption has been brought up. I believe Summer Wells was another case that we covered in the past where there are some people that believe that might also be the case in that investigation as well. Uh, as far as how common it is, I never dealt with it in my career. Uh, that doesn't say a ton because I think this is something that would probably happen in the more rural areas, but it can happen anywhere. And considering what we've discussed so far, it's definitely not something that I would rule out. And I can see where Sheriff Bunch and his team are coming from. Absolutely. Especially with what we know about this case so far. Now, around the time that Bunch came out with these statements, the ground search for Wesley was called off. They had scoured every inch of property within a five mile radius of Wesley's home, but found zero sign of him. The police later reported that Ruby showed no concern when the search efforts stopped. A few days later, Ruby agreed to undergo a second round of questioning by the FBI regarding Wesley's disappearance. Now, judging by what I'm about to tell you, I think it's safe to say that the interview did not go well. After the interview was over, investigators expressed frustration after repeatedly questioning Ruby and Burnell without obtaining any answers. They urged Wesley's relatives to come forward and cooperate with authorities. Sheriff Bunch said, quote, We often get to a point that Ruby won't talk to us and won't talk to anybody. But somewhere down the line, she's got to put her trust in somebody, and that person could help us. On June 5th, Sheriff Bunch told the Enterprise Journal that Ruby and Burnell were suspects in Wesley's disappearance. He said bluntly, quote, they know where that boy's at. The next day, it came to light that after Burnell went to jail for attempted murder, Ruby started seeing a man in Zachary, Louisiana. There were some reports of sightings of Wesley at this man's residence, which prompted a police search. Now, unfortunately, Wesley wasn't found there, and the man couldn't offer any valuable information during the questioning. Following this development, progress in the investigation slowed down significantly, with minimal updates in the media. According to the police, as time passed, Ruby didn't ask for updates in the case either. As for Burnell, he entered into a plea deal for the attempted murder charge. Ultimately, he pleaded no contest to aggravated battery and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. In May of 2003, it had been two years since Wesley went missing. Now, around this time, forensic laboratory students at Louisiana State University created an age-progressed photo of what Wesley might look like at four years old. 
Sheriff Bunch later reported that his office received some calls after people saw the picture, but no one had the leads investigators were searching for. Sheriff Bunch shared with the Associated Press that he believed Wesley was still alive and possibly living in Mississippi. He said Ruby, who had since moved to Jackson, Louisiana, remained their primary suspect. Additionally, Bunch disclosed some new details, possibly hinting at a motive. Wesley had gone missing shortly after Ruby won a custody dispute with his father, Dewey. Furthermore, Wesley was reported missing one day before Ruby was scheduled to appear in court. She was facing charges stemming from the altercation with Burnell's former girlfriend, the one that led to the police finding out that Burnell had shot John. March 14, 2005, would have been Wesley's sixth birthday. His parental aunt, Mary, shared with Nine News that she prays one day Wesley will come home. She said, quote, I feel like he's still alive and I hope wherever he is, they're taking care of him. They're not mistreating him or abusing him. Sheriff Bunch revealed that he still thinks about and prays for Wesley. He said, quote, In my mind, I still think that little feller's alive somewhere. I got a feeling in my heart that Ruby knows where that baby's at. Just the way she responded to the situation and the way she handled it. In January of 2008, authorities investigating Wesley's case believed they had a significant breakthrough when Ruby was charged in Jackson, Louisiana with attempting to sell her unborn baby for $2,000. Now, according to investigators, Ruby had become pregnant the previous year, but decided not to keep the baby. Instead, she arranged to meet with the couple interested in adoption. Despite the couple's desire to adopt, they couldn't afford the legal process, so Ruby proposed a deal. They would pay her $2,000, and she would give the baby to them directly. They formalized the agreement by meeting with a notary and signing all the documents. However, after giving birth, Ruby developed a bond with the baby and refused to transfer custody to the adoptive parents. This led to anger and frustration from the couple, prompting them to report Ruby to the authorities. Consequently, she was arrested and charged with attempting to sell her baby. Now, after Ruby was arrested, her court-appointed attorney, Rhonda Covington, argued that the $2,000 payment was not for the baby, but rather intended to cover medical expenses. She explained that prosecutors targeted Ruby under the assumption that she was involved in her son's disappearance, possibly through an illegal adoption. Covington dismissed the accusation as absurd, stating, quote, She was a teenager with a fifth grade education when Wesley disappeared, yet she was supposed to outsmart the sheriff's office and the FBI? Now, upon further investigation, authorities confirmed that the funds were indeed used for medical purposes. Although the arrangement was still illegal, authorities lacked the substantial evidence to prosecute Ruby for attempting to sell her baby, and the charges were dropped. Over the next few years, there were minimal updates except for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children releasing an age-progressed photo of Wesley at ages 9 and 12. In 2012, Richard Sobers, a retired Baton Rouge police officer, grew concerned about the lack of progress in Wesley's case. He reached out to offer assistance in the investigation, but his offers were reportedly ignored. Feeling compelled to take action, Sober started his own unofficial investigation. He produced flyers, posters, pens, and wristbands featuring Wesley's most recent age progress photograph and passed them out everywhere. Now, according to Sobers, he also planned a vigil to keep Wesley's case in the public eye. However, he encountered resistance from some of Wesley's relatives who threatened a lawsuit if Sobers didn't stop looking into the cold case. Sobers told Bayou Justice, quote, Wesley's aunt called me regularly for a time and has recently reached out to express her gratitude for my efforts. But back when I planned the vigil, she asked me to stop before someone got hurt. Sobers was undeterred and kept spreading awareness for Wesley's case. By May of 2014, 13 years had passed since Wesley disappeared the East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Department announced that they had revisited the case with the FBI a month earlier to ensure they were covering all their bases. Wesley's paternal aunt Mary spoke to WBRZ and shared that the family still holds hope and continues to pray for Wesley's safe return. She emphasized that he would now be 15 years old, just three years shy of adulthood. She said, quote, If he sees this, we want him to know that we love him dearly and never gave up on him. The following month, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released an updated age progression photo to depict what Wesley might look like at 15 years old. 
By December of 2015, retired Officer Sobers was still trying to gain awareness for Wesley's case. He told the Associated Press that in his opinion, Wesley's relatives and Parrish County officials hadn't done enough to pursue leads. He didn't understand why people weren't looking for him. The East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Department fought back against this statement, explaining that the case remained an active investigation. They emphasized regular coordination with the FBI, stating, quote, We've never stopped investigating the case. Some months we have more leads than others. It's never been put on the shelf to sit there. We work on this case year round. Sheriff Bunch said he remained convinced Wesley was alive, possibly in Mississippi, and that his mother sold him. In response, Ruby's attorney, Rhonda Covington, told the media Rudy played no part in her son's disappearance. She said, quote, There was a theory that the police had come up with that maybe Ruby had sold the child, but there was never, ever a shred of evidence to that, and there was no reason for her to do that. She added, quote, What happened was a tragedy. It was a huge tragedy, and it's just compounded by constantly crucifying the parents. So, this is subjective. Some of you may agree with this attorney, even if you think Ruby's guilty. Some of you may not. Personally, I always look at, by saying this publicly, what does it do for the case? How does it help it? And the short answer is, I don't think it does. I think that Sheriff Bunch is more doing this for himself as a way of letting Ruby know that he knows what happened, even though he can't prove it. He knows what she did, and she's going to have to pay for it in this life or the next. Now, as far as the investigation is concerned, on a more pr practical level, I don't think calling this person out is going to make her come forward. I don't think you saying publicly, this is what occurred, she did it, that she's going to go, you know what, you're right, you've been saying it so many times, yeah, I did it, I confess. It's not going to work that way. So I don't think it necessarily helps the case and probably is not needed to be said by Sheriff Bunch. But I will also say Rhonda Covington coming in, um, she has no way of knowing what happened that day. She wasn't involved when it happened. She wasn't there, uh, as was anybody else not there. So she doesn't know what happened. She wasn't there. Neither was anybody else. Uh, only Ruby really knows what happened that day. So I appreciate her lawyer coming out and defending her. But at the same time, if we found out tomorrow that Ruby did, in fact, have some involvement with this case, her lawyer, Rhonda, would be the first one out there saying, well, from what she told me, she she was innocent. How was I supposed to know? And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Do I necessarily agree with what Sheriff Bunch is saying? No, it doesn't really help the case. Um, but I don't necessarily agree with what Rhonda Covington is saying either, although she's not in charge of the investigation. She's just doing her job and, and defending her client. Either way, it really doesn't help anyone and in no way, shape, or form does it help what really is important here, and that's finding Wesley. In April of 2016, the FBI reopened Wesley's case and deployed their child abduction rapid deployment team. Officials didn't disclose the exact reason for revisiting the case, but cited advancements in technology related to missing children's cases as a contributing factor. The FBI announced their plan to spend the next few weeks totally immersed in the case, reviewing all files, conducting follow-up interviews, and searching specific areas. Additionally, the agency planned to utilize other resources such as 21 electronic billboards, which would feature a $10,000 award for information leading to Wesley. To help in these efforts, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released another age progressed photo, this time of Wesley at 17 years old. The FBI said, quote, hopefully we'll be able to turn over a new leaf and somebody will have new information for us. Ruby's attorney told The Advocate that Ruby was excited about the renewed effort to locate her son. Covington said, quote, She's got her hopes up. We think this is probably the best hope we have of finding him. Hopefully, there will be a result this time and not another disappointment. Wesley's paternal aunt Mary told NBC that she too was hopeful for this new development, stating, quote, This could be the thing that brings about the answers. Wesley would be 17 now, just a year from being a grown man. Mary further expressed that this had been a huge struggle for Wesley's father, Dewey, not knowing if his child was okay. She said, quote, Some people said his mother may have given him away or something, but we really can't say. It's all rumors and speculation. NBC reported that there were tensions between the two sides of Wesley's family. Mary said that despite this, everyone shares the same goal, 
bringing Wesley home. She said, quote, for a little boy to just vanish like that is terrifying. Whatever happened, it's sad. Perhaps he's out there not even knowing who he is and that we are out here searching for him. In May of 2018, Wesley had been missing for 17 years. To honor Wesley, retired officer Richard Sobers hosted an event where 17 butterflies were released at the Clinton courthouse, one butterfly for every year Wesley had been gone. Sobers told WAFB, quote, What keeps me going is because I know someone knows something, several people, and I'm hopeful that one day their conscience may get the best of them and they'll come forward or either submit some information anonymously. That same year, Sobers used his own money to rent a physical billboard to feature Wesley's case and the FBI's $10,000 reward. Unfortunately, there haven't been any major updates in the case since then, and more than 22 years later, Wesley is still missing. All right, let's dive right into this perspective because it's going to be straightforward. There's that old saying, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Most of the time that's true. However, we can all acknowledge that some situations result in innocent people going to prison for crimes they didn't commit, even though some of the factors in the case would suggest they were involved. When you look at this case, you have to just use some common sense. It doesn't take a detective to kind of put pieces together in this one, although I will acknowledge just because the puzzle looks right, it could still be a little off. First of all, anyone who has children out there, I know I mentioned mine at the top of the show, if you have a two-year-old or you had a two-year-old at some point, they're not able to walk that fast. They're not running anywhere. So if this was truly five minutes, like, like Ruby had said, Wesley wouldn't have gotten very far, if at, off the porch at all. He might have gotten injured just walking 10 feet. Again, they're just barely walking around at this point. They're not going to be going down rough terrain. So if this was exactly how it looked on the surface where he's on the porch with these four puppies for only five minutes and she didn't look at him at all in between, if she came outside, maybe, worst case scenario, 50 yards, maybe, and that's if he immediately walked off the porch as soon as she went inside, which you would think wouldn't be the case. So 50 yards, maybe, I'll even give you 100 yards, still within an eyesight of her and you know, you would, if she walked around for 15 minutes, she would have been able to uh, most likely find him. Also, just to put it out on a more moral, ethical, you know, level as a, as a, as a dad myself, what are you doing leaving your two-year-old baby on the porch alone for any amount of time? Like, that's just common sense. And if, if Ruby's not involved, I'm sure that's something that weighs on her. And to be just honest about it, it should because if that's truly what happened, this was avoidable. And I'm here to tell all of you guys, I don't care what your backgrounds are or what your beliefs are, you, you can't leave your two-year-olds alone at all, never mind outside where there's a road and there's woods and there's a lot of things that could hurt or even kill them. As far as the puppies, in my opinion, I think it's a decoy. I think it's a diversion. Maybe the puppies were there. Maybe one was put across the road. Maybe the other one was... Uh, left with Wesley as a parting gift. Um, if you're asking me, based on what we know, and we went over the facts tonight from you know from what has been disclosed, and we don't have everything, there was a child custody dispute going on. I don't know what Ruby's financial situation was, but I'm assuming it wasn't great. And if she was facing potential charges the next day, and she had just fought this battle to get Wesley, maybe the idea that the child could go back to Dewey if she were found guilty, uh, was something she was not willing to accept. Couple that with an opportunity to financially benefit from it and maybe the the people where Wesley, uh, were, you know, where he was going and who he was going to be with, maybe they uh, were good people or at least Ruby thought so. To me, just on what we know, and I, 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 I'm so cautious about saying this because there's a real potential here that Ruby is a victim just like everybody else. There's a, there's a strong possibility that she knows what happened and that she was involved. You think about the area, you think about the highway. She herself said there was no vehicle in the area, didn't hear anyone approach the house or walk on the porch. It's highly unlikely that Wesley was abducted in that short period of time in that specific area. 
it is possible that he wandered off, but based on how many individuals and resources were devoted to searching that area, if he had wandered off and been hurt or was hiding, more than likely he would have been found. And he wasn't, which suggests that he was no longer in that area. And then finally, although it's up for debate and it's been highly disputed, there is a couple out there that states and claims that they made an agreement to buy Ruby's unborn child and that there was going to be this adoption and that they signed all this paperwork. That right there is suggestive that it's not beyond the realm of possibility for Ruby to do something like this. Now, I will say this. There could be a scenario where Ruby may know what happened, but maybe she wasn't the primary offender. Maybe it's a situation where Burnell was involved and although Ruby could have been reluctant, it was something that was done between the two of them. Now, Burnell may have not actually been there physically that day, but he could have contributed to uh, the whole situation and been a factor in what occurred, especially when we consider his criminal background. But again, overall, based on what we know about the incident itself and the players involved, it just seems unfortunately, and I hope that I'm wrong, very unlikely that it, that Ruby or Burnell or a combination of the two were not involved in Wesley's disappearance. Now, here's the silver lining in all of this. If this is true, then that would suggest that maybe, maybe Wesley is still alive right now. And maybe he is out there somewhere. And as his Aunt Mary said he might not even know who he actually is or that anybody's looking for him. Now, obviously, that's still a terrible situation on the surface, but I would love to know that he's alive. I would love to know that he's okay. And for all we know, he's maybe living a better life than he would have lived if he were still with Ruby and Burnell. Now, just to play devil's advocate to make sure I'm covering all my bases, if Ruby had left the child outside longer, than she's been telling us over the years, maybe because of a guilty conscience and the optics and the way it would look, it would bring more scrutiny. It does open a window, a larger window, where someone could have grabbed Wesley and a puppy and, and, ta and taken off. And although that window would have still been relatively small, we already know that, that, that it is possible. Ask John Walsh. Ask him about his son, Adam. Uh, he was taken from a, a supermarket. And only took a few moments and he was killed, unfortunately. So we do have case studies to prove that as unlikely as it is, a small window of opportunity is all that the offender really needs. So yes, I'm leaning more toward uh, the family involvement. However, based on what we know, there is a silver lining here where it's more suggestive unless something happened to Wesley and that's why he's no longer around, and that's why he was never found. There is a, a, a strong possibility that he's still out there, he's okay, and he's living a relatively normal life. But ultimately, we want answers, not only for Ruby, not only for Dewey, but for everyone in that community. And like I said, we have the age progress photos, so anybody out there, he could be anywhere in the country at this point if he's still with us. And if that is the case, although it's still tragic in its own right, we can uh, fill him in on what transpired. We still may never know, even if we find Wesley alive, we still may never know what actually happened to him. Obviously, to some degree, he's not going to remember that specific day. And depending on how things were framed, he may have no knowledge of what happened or who was involved. Now, if we locate the people who raised him, that may shed more light on what actually transpired on May 15th, 2001. But either way, it's going to take uh, all of us, this entire community, to potentially locate him. We know that the photos of him and what he may potentially look like today are out there. So just to recap this case, so you have all the information as you're leaving this episode, two-year-old Wesley Dale Morgan was last seen on May 15th, 2001 in the 2700 block of Highway 63 outside of Clinton, Louisiana. At the time, he was three feet tall, 40 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was last seen wearing blue shorts with a green stripe on the leg, a gray Mickey Mouse shirt, and sandals. 
If you have any information, please call Crime Stoppers at 225-344-7867. That's going to do it for me tonight, guys. Everyone stay safe out there, and I'll see you next week.